Hi, this is Katie Push, Senior Director of Product and Integration at Cox2M, and you're listening to Experiencing Data with Brian T. O'Neill. You're now Experiencing Data with Brian O'Neill. Experiencing Data explores how product managers, analytics leaders, data scientists, and executives are looking at design and user experience as a way to make their custom enterprise data products and analytics applications more useful, usable, and valuable. And now, here's your host, the founder and principal of Designing for Analytics, Brian O'Neill. Welcome back to Experiencing Data. This is Brian T. O'Neill. Today I have Katie Push on the line from Cox2M. How are you, Katie? I am wonderful. How are you, Brian? I'm doing great. And we're going to talk about data products. And you've you've lived and swam through the soup of these things before and have some lessons learned here. Currently, you're at Cox2M. You're the Senior Director of Product and Integration. What the heck does that mean? Um, I had that same question after I started. The integration part in particular <laughs> is uh, is a little non-standard. Um, at Cox2, when we work on IoT products, Internet of Things products, and part of what attracted me to the role is there is a ton of data in IoT. Products, that part's fairly self-explanatory product management. The integration part, we really emphasize having a holistic solution that incorporates the different pieces of technology that we build at Cox2M. And so that's the integration piece. But oversee product management and user experience. Um, we have five different market verticals at Cox2M that we, we work in um, across automotive and smart cities and all sorts of fun and intriguing uh, spaces. So that's what I do at the moment. In the past, you know, before I worked on anything that involved hardware, software, what we call IoT, my brain as a designer would immediately jump to like the hardware. And fast forward, when I hear IoT, I'm just thinking we're talking about data, data products here. Like the sensors are just the the infrastructure to get access to data that helps us do stuff. Is that the framing you think about as well when you hang in the IoT space? When I first joined Cox2M, I did think about it that way, especially in the past several months, I've had the opportunity to get a little bit closer to our customers than I was in the beginning parts of my tenure here at Cox2M. And it's just a SaaS product in the sense that the quality of your data is still dependent on your customers' workflows and their ability to engage in workflows that supply accurate data. And it's been a little bit enlightening to realize that the same is true for IoT, right? It's it's not like a fully foolproof interaction that you're engaging with. And so the user experience in that hardware piece is still actually very, very wholly Im- important in ensuring that the devices are being used and the processes support getting clean data from the IoT devices. So sure. It is ultimately all about the data, but there's there's really a focus on the workflow on the front end to make sure that the user experience of your product is facilitating getting the data that you then need to create the insights to facilitate the other aspect of the user experience. So it's all very interrelated in a very interesting way. What you just said about workflow, this is, for me, I want to ask you if you kind of have a definition of data product, but when I think about it, this end-to-end concept where we're thinking about workflow, and in your case, we're thinking about data collection as well, the, the, the hardware that's involved, and maybe, you're involved, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about what the sensor, uh, what is the hardware involved in the IoT piece and whether or not you're designing those interfaces and or the hardware itself so that you can facilitate the downstream objectives that you have or whether it's third party. So I'd love you to talk about that, especially with the metrics toilet syndrome that I've seen before, which is like, because this device captures all this telemetry, it must be useful and we should have charting to display it. And we don't know how anyone would need it, but we're so afraid of taking away stuff because they put it in there. So the temperature outside must be relevant to the sensor for somebody, but no one can explain why they need to know the temperature outside to do X, which seems totally unrelated. Tell me, I don't, (laughs) is this familiar to you or I don't know? (laughs) Well, I I am I am smiling um, for a specific reason. I want to back up and give your listeners the context of earlier in my career before I made it into product. And you know this, but your listeners may not. I started out as a data analyst. Um, I came up through data analytics, and so very familiar with this conundrum from an analyst perspective of you know, the answer is 42. Why does that matter? Like like providing insights to executives that are interesting is not really very impactful. You want to provide things that are actionable and that drive the business forward. And so coming into product from that background, yes, sometimes it makes me 
smile and reflect and try to engage in a constructive, educating kind of a conversation about like, well, this these conversations we hear about data monetization, like just because data exists does not make it valuable. We need to understand what it's driving at and what problem is it's solving. And actually, there are some very real pragmatic constraints in IoT devices about the size of the data packets that are being sent through. So I do think it's important to have that prioritized discussion about how often you need certain types of data being sent through and what insights they're they're driving rather than the blanket approach that's so often touted of just, well, it's data and therefore we must need it for something. Right, right. Whether we figured out what or not. And similarly, the data that we collect from these sensors is all for a purpose. It's all for a specific insight that we want to derive and send through ultimately to the software user interface of our products um, to make use of. So I want to take this out of the abstract and make it physical and visual for people. What What is the sensors that you're working with at Cox2M? Like what's the business or user workflow problems that you're solving? Kind of what is that end-to-end from hardware to software? Tell, tell us, why would I buy whatever you're selling at Cox2M? We are primarily a B2B service provider, and so some people may not. But we do have um, one vertical called Kayo that is is sold on Amazon. I'm going to focus on the automotive side of our business because there's some nice, you know, just congruency there. So, for instance, the hardware that we sell, we call it an OBD connector internally. There's probably something more marketing friendly that I should be calling it. But it's a piece of hardware that plugs into the onboard diagnostic port of a vehicle. And so if you apply this in an automotive sales perspective, for instance, with car dealerships, what that does is it helps them track the location of the vehicle, you know, check engine lights or things that they might need to be aware of about the vehicle's health while it's sitting on their lot, which we call voice of the car. So there's some things that a car dealership wants to be aware of about the vehicles, the assets in this case in its care. From a small business fleet perspective, we also created a product called Kayo, which small business owners can purchase on Amazon, actually, and there's an app experience where you can track your small business fleet and understand where it's been and where it's going, send communications to the driver. You get that same sort of notification, voice of the car, is is there a piece of maintenance that needs to be done in this car so that you encourage the drivers who are caring for your vehicles of your small business to make sure that they're maintaining your vehicles and prolonging the life of your asset. That's a lot of what we do, and it sounds very it sounds very simple at the highest level, but there are a ton of very interesting algorithms and technical considerations when it comes into something that sounds very simple, like just keeping an eye on the location of a vehicle. <laughs> so so accuracy of that information. Yes. Yeah. So you mentioned workflow earlier. So if this is something new, help my audience understand, how do you start what I call the zero to one? How do you get to a design if you walked in the door as a user experience person or a product person, it's like, oh, we have all these sensors that track vehicle locations and there's supposed to be a digital product at the end that's going to solve some business problem. And then there's all this stuff in between that. How does one approach turning this into an experience that solves a user's pain that they're willing to pay money for? How do you approach that work? And especially in that, that first iterations and the early stages. I wasn't here for Cox 2M's zero to one. I came in a little bit later to help try to start scale it. So I want to use an example that I was actually part of, (laughs) Um, which isn't IoT, but still data product centric. So for me, the zero to one comes from ensuring that we deeply understand either the decisions, and again, my background is B2B, so I'm going to talk in in terms of business decision makers and things of that nature, but the decision that a business user needs to make or the action that they need to take to improve their business outcomes. So the first thing that I always look at is, is actually a holistic kind of market strategy of here's the decision maker who's going to decide whether it's worth spending money on my product or not? What strategically is keeping them up at night? If I can answer that question, and then I layer on making a Venn diagram, right? So one side of it is what's the strategic problem that's keeping them up at night? The other side of the Venn diagram is what are our technical capabilities or ability to gather data about that could help alleviate one or more of those strategic concerns? And then the overlapping space of the Venn diagram is where I focus my efforts on creating prototypes and taking it back to those 
to those business leaders and saying, does something like this help you move forward? Would you spend money on this? How much money would you spend on this? So, and then build that MVP as expediently and and expensively as possible to prove out your hypothesis that this is a market worth capturing, which has taken some trial and, and error, right? The first times I worked through this cycle, it was painful and long, right? Longer than it should have been and had some stumbles. So I certainly haven't had perfect adoption from some of my earliest products, but over time, that's the playbook that I've, I've developed, right? Understand what people will pay money for and how that overlaps with our ability to solve problems for them. Build that as quickly and cheaply as possible, prove it out, and then gain market traction in the way that that industry supports, right? I've worked in some industries where you needed like a big bang industry event launch kind of a thing in order to gain market traction. I've worked in others that were more wholly based in word of mouth. So you needed a center of just really fanatical customers who wanted to talk to their peers about you. So the market dynamics of how word spreads about a product's usefulness are also really important to understand. And I've been lucky that I've had some really smart marketing partners in my past who have helped me figure out that side of the equation, but I don't want to leave it out. So the workflow aspect of that, sorry to bring it all back to the question that you actually asked, is if you understand the decision that needs to be made or the action that needs to be happened, you you also have to understand that that's not happening in a vacuum. So what are they doing before or after they go in search of this information? And how can you embed your data product in the most optimal way to ensure that the data is not just actionable, but it's also timely and it's embedded in something that they're already doing. Because people are busy and they're thinking about a million things and they weren't using your product before. So it's a lot to ask them to completely change the way that they're doing things to like stop and be like, oh, there's a dashboard for this someplace that I should, what's the URL for that again? Like, what should I be? So embedding embedding your data product within a user's existing workflow in some way, finding a way to anchor it there has been really important. And then similarly, the workflow that I was alluding to on the IoT side, you know, again, I wasn't here for the zero to one, but the piece of workflow that's really impactful there is we're asking for an even higher degree of change management in that case, but because we're asking them to attach this device to their vehicle at some point and then detach it at a different point in time. And right, there's a procedure in the solution to allow for that. But someone at the dealership, for instance, has to engage in that process. So there's a change management in the workflow that the juice has to be worth the squeeze to encourage a customer to embark in that journey with you. So there's one side of it, which is happy path, figure out a way to embed your product in the customer's existing workflow. That's where the most success happens. But in the situation we find ourselves in right now with the IoT, we do have to ask them to change their workflow. But that's a very, very intentional aspect of our product adoption that we have to be mindful about providing best practices about who's the role in your organization, who we've seen this be most successful when it sits with, and you know what should the ideal operation be so that we're not asking a customer to start from scratch and figure it all out themselves. When you're asking these uh, customers, I, I, mean, I might call them users and just use this interchangeably, but you stop me if you don't want to do it that way. When you're asking them to use something new, such as, yes, I do need you to depart and go to this URL because that's where all this insight lives or whatever, is the correlation of adoption and usage purely a function of how big of a pain does this relieve for me? What the reward is or is there more to it? Yeah, it's a giant pain and there's no more thefts of test drive vehicles or whatever the reason is like a dealership wants this. Is that still not enough or do you find it is? If you can relieve a giant pain that, like you said, keeping people up at night, if you can take that away, they're going to use it. I do agree with that framing of, you know, there's two sides of the equation and the benefit side has to be greater than the cost side for someone to change their behavior to do it. And I think that's that's why the starting out point of what are the strategic priorities, what keeps you up at night are so important is because the reality is you try to minimize it as much as possible, but there's some impact to workflow. There's some new step that a user needs to engage in. So you try to minimize that, but you also need to maximize the value of the pain that you're alleviating in order to encourage that behavior change in my experience. And so my very first data product that I launched was 
I'm biased. I would like to say it was impressive from like a from a data capability standpoint, but it was absolutely not embedded in anyone's workflow. It it had really poor user adoption and you know was a great learning experience of this particular company on our on our path to, you know, more advanced data products, but certainly I wouldn't call a success in its own right. And that was that was really the key lesson learned from that was that the dashboards were too dense. It wasn't clear what someone was supposed to get out of it. The problem that we were solving was actually not the biggest strategic problem for the decision makers. And so we had one very small, very devoted set of users who really valued the data that was was contained in this analytics product. But to a broader extent, no one could be bothered to care that it existed, right? It was too great a change. It was too difficult to consume and the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. And compare that to a later product where we did the work on the front end to understand how do people want to consume this information and what are the key decisions that they're making at what point in time and really put forward an effort to having it be that point in time delivery, right? And that product achieved rather rapid market traction and was a great success. And that's really the key difference. When you, you talked about spending the time up front on the front end, are, are you talking about user, user research and design and getting all the different technical people in the same room together with product management? Is it that kind of thing or, or something else? That is a piece of it. That part's necessary. The user experience partners that I was paired up were also different in those two journeys. And so, so there's a lot of variables that changed. But but keep so keep in mind, I was younger in my career as well, had some lessons to learn, and I also didn't have this focus on user experience. So bleh, kind of bleh, dense dashboards. And the second time being paired with someone who is very mature in their perspective on user experience and being able to translate the silly little Excel prototype, because I think in data, so the silly little Excel prototype that I provided of like, this is what I'm trying to get across with this Excel prototype. And then converting the, it into this beautiful prototype that we were able to then go and test with customers and change before we even hit production or, you know, development of what would be our production product. Because we needed to ensure we happened to partner with a, with a BI platform to build this on top of to speed our time to market, right? But we needed to make sure that, that the underlying partner that we worked with was able to meet the output that we knew was going to be successful in the market. So we actually started with the user experience and then worked backward to make sure there's technical constraints always, right? But we needed to make sure that we were accepting the technical constraints that we were comfortable with and that we were optimizing for the best user experience possible so that we'd get the adoption and the value. I'm always interested in how do we bring design and user experience into places where the primary makers of the solutions, I will call them designers because you can't not make a design choice. You can just make unintentional ones. So if that's what your team is made of, it's primarily of data scientists and analysts. How and when do you know when to bring this in? And, and can you paint a clear picture of what the difference is or what you've seen change as you've changed the way you do this now? If you were to change jobs right now, go into a similar IoT space, just different company, you have a methodology that you use that's not the old one. Right. What was it that changed that made you value that and, and, and how you just kind of approach it? I hadn't ever put it in those words, but I think I realized what you just said is there's no such thing as, you know, not having a design choice. There's just unintentional ones. I think the really key thing that is always true, it's just I think everyone goes on their own path to discovering that it's true. It's that it is much faster to design and prototype and find out what you don't know that you don't know up front than it is to develop a thing and find it out later. You might early on feel this like rush of, yes, we're moving faster because we're developing faster, but but actually that's a, that's a false sense of winning. Race and to the so, outputs. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so I think that's really one of the really key lessons that I learned through experience. And if there's a way to teach people that lesson without them experiencing it themselves, then I would love to know what that is because I think we'd save people a lot of pain. But I, I wonder if people just kind of have to go through their own journeys to learning it. But if you build and launch a product that doesn't have success in the market, then I think you 
that's not what anybody wants. That's not what the engineers who contributed to that product want. That's not what the designers want. That's not what product wants. That's not what the company wants. That's not what anybody wants. You realize, oh, I could have, I could have figured out a better way before we started development. So I really think it was that, that lesson learned of seeing, you know, I'm proud that we got the product to market, but it wasn't successful. And I think that unsuccessful products come with some very important lessons that we carry with us to the next one. That one was just a a scar, (laughs) you know, that I learned from. So I I think that's really what changed. And I I think that that has led to a series of just how do I optimize to get even better outcomes? How do I make sure that users are going to adopt this, that it adds value for the users and therefore that it adds value for the company because it's being adopted and people are willing to pay money for it. But I hate to say it's as simple as that because it's a painful lesson to learn, but it really is just seeing the outcome that you don't want to happen and realizing that you have the power to prevent that. Is there a different way that we need to work when we bring user experience and design work into the data space that's not like it is in, say, traditional software or something like that? Are there things designers need to learn from data science? Are there things data science and analytics people need to learn from design Is the dance different or is the dance mostly the same at the highest level? I think one really important lesson that I I had to learn and was a painful lesson to learn, and I see almost every data analyst I've ever talked through goes through a similar kind of painful lesson of we have this data skill set and we want to apply these sophisticated techniques and we want to to deliver all of these, these pieces of value to our decision makers, whether that's a user, whether that's an executive sponsor, whatever. We want to deliver this value to the decision makers, these insights. We speak a language of data and we sometimes take for granted like that we think everyone speaks that language, but not everyone speaks that language. And so one of my earliest career experiences was being told by my manager who wasn't a data person, she was a marketing person, but had very sage advice for me that I've kept with me throughout my career. I would, um, I was responsible for communicating these insights to our executive stakeholders and she would say, you need to add a key takeaway to that slide. And I would say, but it's redundant. The chart always already says that. Like that's clearly what the chart says. Why do I need to write it in English in in words. (laughs) Yeah. And she tried to gently make me aware that that's what the chart said to me, but that's not what the chart said to everyone. I think there's this language barrier that happens between data analysts and everybody else because we speak this language that we feel very fluent in. And we're like, what is it that you're not picking up on? It says it very clearly in this chart. And that's just not the way that everyone sees the world. And I think that's helpful and I think that's a gift, but I think it can be a barrier to communication when you assume that everyone else can communicate the way that you communicate or see things the way that you see things. So that's the main thing I'm aware of is that limitation on the data analyst side that I want more data analysts to be comfortable with what they often perceive to be dumbing it down but I've come to not see it that way. It's really just an effort to communicate more clearly with your audience because what what does the insight matter if no one else grasped it, right? And the way to communicate it is not with being more precise with your numbers and adding an extra couple of fancy you know, statistics. Uh, it's just to communicate the output of your analysis more clearly to the person who needs to be able to make a decision. And so that intentionality with communicating, I think is something that I learned over time, which enabled me to work more successfully with that user experience designer later on in my career, who was able to translate what I was trying to communicate into something even better, because I was able to be like, I know this is the essence of what the decision maker needs to know. And since I can communicate that to you, can you help me translate it into a design that's going to communicate that with the least effort possible for a user? So communication is what I'm going to boil all of that down to. Communication is difficult when you speak a language that you think everyone else speaks, but they, they don't. I think the challenge is even higher when we compare doing an ad hoc analysis on something, presenting a PowerPoint deck that's probably been narrated and and has plenty of space to like draw conclusions and then provide evidence versus a self-service tool where there's no human being telling you how it works. And so we're designing this for people that we may never meet one day. And obviously you can't design for everyone equally. The challenge is even harder with self-service software tools doing this 
Is that your perspective as well? To me, the game is much harder. <laughs> I agree. Um, I have come to think that there are two main camps of data products, and I'm open to learning from experience to broaden this horizon as well. But m my experience so far has taught me there are two main data products. There's one that is designed for a more sophisticated data user that is really self-serve and I can make my own charts and graphs and I can fully explore and click around and do what I need to do. But designing a tool that way in itself implies certain things about your user, which is that they understand how to use a business intelligence tool and how to build charts and graphs and how to interpret the data that lies within those, those charts and graphs. Those have an audience in my experience, that needs to be targeted at a data user, at someone who has some level of sophisticated knowledge about how to interact with those things or is at least willing to put in the time to learn how to interact with one of those things and has more experienced knowledge about the data that's being explored so that they can draw conclusions from that angle. The other side, which is the side that, that I've ended up focusing on more as I've progressed in my career because I've found them to be more successful with a broader audience, but they take more work up front is that you have to define what decision is my user making on a repeated basis that is worth building something that does automatically. And so you say, what are the questions that my user needs answers to on a repeated basis? And then you probably have some filters or some slicing and dicing based on their most common needs to see that. But at its essence, you're answering three or four questions for that user. And they have to be the most important three or four questions for your user to add value. And that can be a difficult thing to derive with confidence. And I think that's the other reason that embracing the prototyping early on has been really important. Because if you spend six months building a product that automates the wrong three or four questions and you don't realize it till you hit the market, then everything about your underlying product might need to change. The way that you've designed your data pipelines might not facilitate answering the other three or four questions that you've now come to realize. And it's not that that's an insurmountable problem, but it's certainly a problem that you don't want to be dealing with post-launch. Yeah, yeah. Well, not to mention just the, the technical baggage, the emotional yes. baggage of, are you kidding me? We just yes. like spent all this time and now we're going to undo it. Like, <laughs> And now there's, now there's a lack of confidence in the organization. Well, how do we know you're right this time? Why should we right. build this one? Why, why won't it just be the same story? So, you know, building that conviction early on that you're solving the right problem, that you're answering the most important question is really key for me. A challenge I know for a lot of data product leaders is a lot of times they're asked for something and the the need is expressed as a solution. I need a model that will do X. They've already assumed that they need a machine learning model and they already assume that they know what telemetry or data they need to answer the question. But the question itself has not actually been stated yet. They just gave an answer. And then someone sees that as if I just give them exactly what they asked for, then they should use it, right? And you probably know that's not how it always works. And we have to dig we have to surface this. And you said it's it's not always easy to figure out what the three or four things are. Is this where research comes in? Or tell me, how, how do you get to the confidence level that we know that we've now figured out what those magic three or four things are? And if our product or data product answers these things routinely, we're probably going to have a win, or at least where we've really de-risked the chance that we're going to build the wrong thing here. Is there a signals you, you feel or know the spidey sense that goes off when you've hit on that, or, or is there a method you use to make sure I never take anything with a grain of salt, I'm going to dig, 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 and then when I hit X, then I'll be convinced that we should make that? I don't have any hard thresholds, and I think that's a hard thing, is that I have, you know, along with data analysis, it was market research. Those were sort of coupled for me early on in my career. So like market research being a part of it, I, I've developed a bit of intuition to the way that I navigate this, and that's made it difficult to really prescribe to someone else kind of like what are the things that make it successful when I do it. I will say that I'm a big fan of triangulating. So I'm a big fan of exploratory qualitative interviews. I'm a big fan of uh, Nahito, nothing important happens in the office, um, and going out to a customer's location to observe um, I think there's so much context that you can pick up on the way that the team is talking to each other in their office, especially in a B2B context, right? How do, how do they work together? The, that gets at a lot of the workflow stuff that's really difficult to just ask questions about. Like you can go and see that like, oh, this piece of paper gets transferred from this person's desk to that person's desk. And that never would have come up in an interview, uh, right? Just like little things like that. Or they're using paper, like... <laughs> 
so much like, more common than you might expect. Right. Like so Wait, many there's of, a fax machine involved here. So <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Um, you did say car dealership. There's probably a fax machine involved. <laughs> there's so much paper in the world still. Um, yeah. You know, I'm a I'm a big fan of those things. I'm a big fan of going out and have quali- having qualitative exploratory interviews that get at like what's the most strategic problem you need to solve. If they bring a solution to me, which is indeed common, I try to dig at like, okay, what are you going to do with that? How are you going to engage with that solution? How does it change your behavior? How does it change what you do next? Because that's really the output that they're looking for is the way that it changes what happens next. And so that's been a helpful way to approach that specific topic. But I am a fan of the qualitative interviews, but I'm also a fan of triangulating. So I don't just do interviews. There's also industry trends or trade shows or like subject matter expertise about like what's going on in this industry that will tend to triangulate with the top strategic problems that your customers are telling you about. They don't always fit as like a one-to-one thing. They're not going to be exact mirror images of each other. And I think that's positive because if if they're not exact, if you're finding a little bit of a space between where your company can differentiate itself, then that's actually ideal. But you should start to find some like puzzle pieces that fit together in your triangulation, right? So if you have three or four different pieces of information, competitive industry, customer, technology that are pointing in the same cohesive direction and you can find a differentiated value add there, then that's really the ideal space to be. So I don't put all my eggs in one basket. But also because of that, if I have six customer conversations and I'm hearing basically the same thing and I've got those other triangulating pieces of information, then I feel more confident moving forward with those six conversations because it's not actually really just those six conversations. And then the development process itself gives you opportunities to continue to challenge your own beliefs and tweak and adjust as you go, right? And I think that iterative feedback loop and decision-making has also been really key. It sounds so fluffy and like vague about what you get for doing. I went on and talked to somebody. Is there a something that surfaced in your automotive product or one of these other products as a learning that came out of going into the field and doing this kind of research or conversations where it's like, we never would have put this in until we found out X and it's just not going to come out. It's not going to they're not going to write that down because it's just their lived experience and they're not omniscient about their own life. The paper being passed or like, wait a second, what happened? You carried a paper? Yeah, I always do that every morning at nine. Like what? You know, <laughs> is, there, is there something like that where it became something in a solution or just an insight that, that recently sticks out that came from doing that kind of work? I don't have a precise example like that, but I, th- I think the example that I want to share that's tangential is my first data product that wasn't all that successful in the market as we've as we've discussed. I was very proud of the methodology, which is that we figured out what decisions the users needed to make and it was this top line outcome that they were trying to improve. And then we applied what I started calling a driver model. What's driving that output so that you can do some data analysis to figure that out and and fix the inputs so that you get a better output. It was just a regression model. We just looked at all the data. We ran a regression model. Here's the here's the features. They feed into the output. Awesome. And so I was proud of that methodology. I thought that was pretty cool. And when I went on to a different company to build a data product there, I thought, yeah, that's basically my framework for how I think we should help users make decisions with data. As we figure out the output they're looking at, we evaluate the data to find the inputs that'll lead to that. How do they optimize? And that's the answers that we give them. And so when I joined this company, that was basically my framework for what I was going to go and execute for them. I needed to execute quickly. That was my framework. Awesome. That's what I think I'm going to come in and do. That's how. That's what I think I know how to come in and do. This was a real estate company. So I went out to real estate brokerages and I talked to a handful of real estate brokerages in their offices and asked them like, what do you really need to know? Like, what do you wish you knew? What would change the outcome for your brokerage? The answers that I got were so much simpler than what I was going to go out and try to build. And I think that's also an example of like the data analyst wanting to use all these. I I want to use a regression model. Why can't I use a regression model? What you're asking for is basically just, you know, addition and subtraction. I really wanted to do something fancier for you. But the problem that they needed solved did not require a driver model, did not require anything fancy. It just required being more aware of some of the financial happenings in their 
and their brokerage and being able to analyze that on a couple of key filters so that they could spot like which agents needed coaching, for instance, which agents need coaching, which agents should I be retaining because they're contributing most of the bottom line revenue for my company. It was a simple problem. And I would not have figured that out if I had approached the conversations in a different way or if I hadn't gone out to talk to them, if I had just been like, yeah, we're going to try to help them improve revenue, obviously. So what's driving revenue? Let's go look at the data. Like, no, I needed to talk to the users and find out that what they needed was much simpler than a regression model. They just needed visibility so that they could drive their coaching and retention behaviors. And that's ultimately what the tool became was a facilitator of coaching and retention of agents. (laughs) So often there is something like that where it's an insight that, that again, it comes out of something you weren't, you didn't go there to ask about that at all, but it surfaces as a more bleeding pain, as, a, as a something that would be a game changer. And I think it could be hard if we think like, but my identity is wrapped up in the fact I know what a regression model is and how to make one. <laughs> yeah. And so I need to deploy this hammer on this job because that's what I do. I went to school for it or whatever. Like I'm, my identity is wrapped up in that and I think product people have to be really good at letting go of some of this, like, well, we have all these skills, but like my job is to deliver an outcome for the users and or the business stakeholders that we serve, whatever the tooling required is, right? And at some point you might need something like that, but that might be about getting from like 82 to 90% accurate or some lift of, of quality improvement, but not about that zero to one, or even just knowing, are we even in the same solar system here about what we're trying to do? I could drill your brain and ask you a million other questions, but I want to respect your time here. Thank you for for coming on here. Do you have any closing thoughts or advice for people trying to get into data product management, maybe things that they might need to let go of if they're coming out of the data science or, or analyst role? Like there are also leaders listening to the show that I think it'd be a hard sell for me to go get headcount to hire this role that I find hard to define. So I might have to start with upskilling or changing the people I have. You know, John or Mary is the kind of has shows some affinity for this quote stuff. What are the things that they need to be aware of? Skills, uh, any of that that you might leave us with? I am a bit biased because of my background, but I think that that finding people in your organization who have the appetite to be cross-functionally educated, particularly in a data arena, is very important. So for instance, a lot of data people, like I mentioned, I I know have communication hangups because they communicate in a certain way and it's hard to accept that everybody else doesn't. And so taking someone with a data background and giving them a little bit more exposure to user experience or product management right, but just how to connect with the problems that the user is trying to solve on a deeper level, I think can be extremely impactful and vice versa. I think you've got a product manager or a user experience designer who's trying to figure out how to design for data products, then you need to get them some data analytics training so that they can understand on a deeper level what their data analysts are trying to communicate with them about what needs to be articulated to the user. And neither one needs to become experts in the other person's field But again, there's this communication gap, I think, between the disciplines um, sometimes and the cross pollination is intended. And the reason I would recommend that is, is that I think it can help close some of those communication gaps. Great advice. It's super great. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, But Katie, before I let you go, where can people follow you? I know we connected on LinkedIn. I'm sure we might have some questions from listeners if they can reach out to you. Is there a good place to do that? LinkedIn probably is the best place. Um, I'm fairly active on LinkedIn. The community is growing on LinkedIn and uh, I'd be excited to engage with people there. Cool. Well, again, this has been Katie Push, Senior Director of Product and Integration at Cox2M. Thank you for coming on Experiencing Data. Thank you. This was so much fun. I appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Experiencing Data with Brian O'Neill. If you did enjoy it, please consider sharing it with the hashtag Experiencing Data. To get future podcast updates or to subscribe to Brian's mailing list, where he shares his insights on designing valuable enterprise data products and applications, visit designingforanalytics.com slash podcast.